President Putin has announced a partial military mobilization to help fight the war in Ukraine. In a television address, President Putin said the West wanted the end of Russia just as it had brought the Soviet Union to an end. It comes a day after Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine announced votes on joining Russia would be held. That mobilization, the first since World War II, is aimed at those with previous military experience and begins right now. 30,000 reservists will also be called up to reinforce the Russian military in Ukraine. Mr Putin said he would support independence in areas of eastern Ukraine currently controlled by Russia-backed separatists. Here's some of what President Putin said in his address on Russian television. I repeat, we're talking of a partial mobilization only. Only people in the military reserve will be drafted. The priority will be on people who served in the armed forces, who have military specialization and experience. Those drafted before being sent to the places of service will have mandatory additional training, relying on experience gained during the special military operation. The decree on partial mobilization has been signed. Well, the Russian president also issued this blunt warning. I want to remind those who allow themselves such statements about Russia that our country also has a variety of weapons of destruction. And if the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we will, without question, use all the means at our disposal to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff. Our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg, who's in Moscow, has more. What we heard, first of all, from the Russian president was an admission, an admission that things haven't been going that well in Ukraine. Until today, the, the official message from the Kremlin to the people here has been that everything is going according to plan with this special military operation. Well, it clearly isn't. If the Russian president is now declaring a partial mobilization and calling up potentially 300,000 military reser reservists, things haven't been going according to plan. But did he say to the Russian people, sorry, this was our mistake, we got it wrong? Of course he didn't. Vladimir Putin did what he does so often. He turned attention to the West and blamed the West and accused the West of wanting Russia's destruction, wanting the disintegration of Russia, blamed everything on the collective West, uh, as he put it. So that was the admission. And then, of course, we got the threat and he made it very clear. He said Russia would use all its means at its disposal to defend Russia if its territorial integrity was threatened. Now, what's that all about? Well, in a few days' time, we've got these so-called referendums coming up in Russian-occupied areas, territories uh, of Ukraine. And um, everybody expects that once the votes are counted, uh, with the Kremlin counting the votes, uh, these territories will have voted to join Russia. And I think what Putin is saying today is sending a very clear message to Ukraine and to the West that once these territories have been annexed by Russia, if you try to attack them or if you try to take these areas back, then Russia will, will respond with force. And he said, this is no bluff, and he had at the end this other threat, those who try to, try to blackmail us with nuclear weapons should know the prevailing winds can turn in their direction. That is a, a message to the West that Russia has nuclear weapons and he claims, I think, will be prepared to use them. And Steve, how alarming will leaders gathering at the United Nations General Assembly in New York already trying to decide how, how to face what's going on in Ukraine? Of course, uh, I think world leaders will be alarmed. It's interesting, Vladimir Putin was at a regional summit last week. Uh, and the message he seemed to get from uh, the leader of China and the leader, uh, the leader of India was that basically war isn't a good idea, that actually perhaps de-escalation would be a good idea. Um, it's the message he seems to have got from the Turkish president too. And yet what we see from Vladimir Putin is escalation after escalation. This is not a leader who is putting his hands up and saying, I got this wrong, um, I need to get out of this somehow. Uh, he's in it deep and he's getting deeper and deeper and he's determined to achieve some kind of military victory uh, and pushing things as far as he can get and sending very strong message today, as we've heard, to Ukraine and to the West. 
Steve Rosenberg in Moscow. Gillian Keegan is a minister at the British Foreign Office. She gave the BBC her reaction to Mr Putin's speech a short while ago. It's a serious threat, but one that has been made before. Um, clearly, um, I guess over the last couple of weeks, uh, the Russian military have lost um, significant ground to the Ukrainians, and I guess that's uh, caused uh, perhaps this, this speech today. But yes, it, it's a serious threat, but I say one that's been made before. But, but, but let, let us be clear, um, it, it doesn't change our stance. We're still unwavering in our support for Ukraine. In fact, the Prime Minister will make a speech today which says, you know, we've already committed £2.3 billion pounds to support Ukraine with their military weapons to make sure that they do have uh, the, the support that they need. And we will continue to do that again next year. Um, we will match that next year. So we are there and we are there to support our Ukrainian colleagues who obviously are on the ground uh, suffering uh, a lot right now. Gillian Keegan. Western leaders have been unequivocal in their condemnation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the United Nations General Assembly currently meeting in New York. Here is just a flavour of some of what the leaders have been saying before President Putin announced that partial mobilisation. Oh. Today, we need to make a simple choice, basically that of war or that of peace. On the 24th of February this year, Russia, a permanent member of the Security Council, through an act of aggression and invasion and annexation, broke our collective security. It deliberately violated the UN Charter and the principles of sovereign equality of states. It's imperative to maintain the international order where the rule of law is firmly established. The United Nations has been playing a central role in the development of such international order. However, we see today its foundations being gravely shaken. Russia's aggression against Ukraine is an act that tramples on the vision and principles of the UN Charter. 141 countries categorically condemned Russia's war for occupation. But that alone isn't enough. If we want this war to end, then we cannot be indifferent to how it ends. Putin will only give up his war and his imperialistic ambitions if he realises that he cannot win. Well, let's bring in uh, Sir Emir Jones-Parry. He is a former UK ambassador to the United Nations and also a former UK permanent representative to NATO, thank you very much for talking to us. It is still very early in the morning, of course, in New York, but what effect are Vladimir Putin's words likely to have uh, on proceedings at the United Nations General Assembly? Well, I think the vast majority, including in a previous vote in the General Assembly, over 140 countries condemned the invasion. So there is widespread disquiet at the war, concern, the hypocrisy of Russia, Russia claiming it's being attacked was actually it mounted an illegal invasion against Ukraine, claiming that its sovereignty is being violated when it is annexing parts of an independent sovereign state. So the tone yesterday of this morning and the increased pressure that he's putting on through mobilization, etc., will be viewed by a great deal of disquiet. But it will only strengthen, I think, the opposition among a swathe of members of the UN. <clears throat> because there are some, very, very few, who might support um, Russia. And you can always see that group, uh, probably about five or six of them. There'll be another group, slightly, slightly larger, who will be people who, one way or the other, are sympathetic to Russia, close to Russia, dependent upon Russia, and they will stay quiet. But the overwhelming majority will be concerned, even more than they have been, and particularly disquieted by the threat to territorial integrity. That's a fundamental of the UN. You go back to the Organization of African Unity in 1960. The very first decision it took was to say that the borders we inherit as we become independent, however illogical they are, however they ignore history, culture, whatever, we stick with those borders because the African countries then knew, as the Kenyan ambassador spelt out clearly the Security Council after the invasion, the threat of unraveling borders is to 
herald a huge amount of conflict. And few want that other than Mr Putin. And I wonder how you view this forthcoming set of referenda that could be held in the next few days in those occupied territories of Ukraine and how they may change things. Because it's, it's nothing new to hear Russia talk about being the victim of Western aggression or Ukrainian aggression. But if those referendum declare that the Donbass and other areas are part of Russia, doesn't that, it enables Russia to say it itself is under attack. And that makes things altogether a lot more serious, doesn't it? Well, it will claim that, but let's look at the nature of the referendum. When we called at a couple of days' notice, what's the electoral list? Who's going to count the votes? This is a rigged election referendum with the sole intention of giving a paper justification for Putin's invasion. And after that, maybe he'll declare that he's achieved his objectives. Who knows? But it does make it more difficult, of course, if he perceives and presents any attack by Ukraine to reclaim its own territory as an attack on Russia, then it becomes more serious. And you can see the tactic behind it. And, and what, I mean, looking at the varying opinions of, of what Russia is doing in Ukraine, how united or disunited might the response of the United Nations be? What can they actually do? Well, what they can do uh, in terms of humanitarian help for people who have been forced to flee, etc., um, beyond that, the body that ought to be acting is the Security Council. Security Council charged with the maintenance of international peace and security, but unable to act because of one of its permanent members, which should have particular responsibility for actually furthering the aims of a charter and making sure that the council does its job, that permanent member, Russia, is actually blocking any action because it is party, of course, to the action. So okay, Security Council blocked, and it is one of the uh, structural problems of the Security Council that the veto exists. But were there not a veto, there wouldn't be a Security Council. So it's a necessary element, but it does at this stage make UN action very different. But there will be a united response by NATO. Of that, there should be no question. So, Emir jones Parry, a former UK ambassador to the United Nations and a former permanent UK representative to NATO, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Gary.